Hi, this is Bruce Rawls, and I'm speaking again with Dr. Bob Rosenthal, who is the author of several books about A Course in Miracles, and the latest of which we've been talking in a couple of previous segments. Uh, the book is From Loving One to One Love, Transforming Relationships Through A Course in Miracles. And uh, as I was telling Bob before we started the recording, uh, I'm, I'm loving this book <laughs> immensely. And uh, uh, reading more each 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 time I read a few more chapters, it's like wow, this is so well written, and uh, I would recommend this to both uh, seasoned course students as well as newbies, as well as anyone just you know slightly interested in what the course is about, um, uh, because it really you know you do a fabulous job, Bob, of, of you know sharing what the course is all about, and both in depth and breadth, as well as making it very accessible and very easy to read and relatable and uh, so anyway kudos <laughs> thank you so much so, yeah you're basically telling me i actually did manage to succeed at the task i set to myself even though through the entire writing of it i was pretty sure i hadn't <laughs> <laughs> well i think if, i think it's kind of a, a reminder that you know if we get ourselves out of the way you know yeah. good stuff comes through right <laughs> well it's the author's dilemma you know too much self-consciousness, and I mean that word in multiple ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, so the sections I would um, have been reading up, up through, uh, let's see, I guess it's about 12, chapters 12 through 13, and 12, 13, 14, and 15, uh, and since we last had a conversation, um, you know, like forgiving the unforgivable, that's that's uh, certainly, uh, certainly when we were just kind of touching on that, I think a little bit of picking, picking our favorite, uh, scapegoats and, and uh, media figures, uh, political figures, uh, uh, that sort of thing. And just recognizing that, uh, you know, those, those are just as amenable to forgiveness as the, 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 what we think of as easily forgivable because of the course's um, no order of difficulties or, or magnitude principle, I suppose, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's in the nature of the ego and it's in the nature of, you know, all of us to not necessarily rank order our forgiveness opportunities, our forgiveness lessons, but to have some sense of, oh, that's impossible. I could never forgive that person to, oh yeah, that, that's easy. I've already forgiven them without the recognition that um, any block to forgiveness, any grievance is equally detrimental to awakening to the nature of your true self, which, mm -hmm necessarily includes that other person um so you know to the extent that there's even a judgment and we see them as different um you know we're getting in the way of our own awakening now you know as easy to say uh not easy to do and it takes a great deal of practice but in a way it's almost a corollary of the idea that i think i talked about in an earlier chapter that um you know every relationship the ego makes is a special relationship. Mm -hmm. We might see some, oh, I'm so in love with that human being, you know, that as the epitome of special relationships, but the ego only knows specialness in special relationships. And a grievance is a form of a special relationship. You know, we single one person out because of something they did or didn't do and hold it against them. Well, that's specialness. It's just bad specialness, negative specialness. So, all the ego's relationships are special. All the Holy Spirit's relationships are holy because they're all, you know, really the same. Um, and therefore, uh, there's no such thing as the unforgivable, although we will see certain things as more difficult to forgive than others, and, which is absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I always like to go to the uh, weightlifting metaphor. Uh, you don't walk into, and I'm not a weightlifter, so this is not coming from experience. <laughs> But you don't walk into the gym and say, hey, load up 300 pounds. Let me see what I can do. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to find you can't do it. And you're going to probably hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you start with those things that you feel you can do, um, those relationships where the forgiveness is clear or the forgiveness opportunities are clear and, and they, your sense is they're within reach, then um, you're building your forgiveness muscles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's pretty pretty normal and 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 uh, you know appropriate to to you know give yeah. ourselves slack for the the things that we think are too challenging and and just be you know patient and and gently vigilant as we go through the process. Huh? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, anything else on, on forgiving the unforgivable? Well, it's, um, I was really looking at almost these ideological positions that many of us take about things that, okay, so in the previous chapter, uh, we were talking about forgiveness as release from the past, that, mm -hmm. that the past is what hardens a grievance, the past is where a grievance is formed, and if we continue to live with the grievance, we're continuing to live in the past and not in the present. So in, in the unforgivable, uh, you know, grievances section, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I bungled the name of the chapter, Forgiving the Unforgivable, I wanted to look at those sort of racial or collective grievances that seem so big that how could anyone forgive them? When people say, how can you forgive Hitler? They're really personifying in the, uh, the name Hitler or the face Hitler, an entire collective grievance against the Nazi party, the Holocaust, and all they did. Mm -hmm. um, of all of them, this probably seems to make the most sense. How can anyone forgive a, a being that instigated and perpetrated genocide? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, we could extend it you know, to Pol Pot or uh, yeah. you know, Rwanda. I mean, sadly, you know, genocide does seem to be a, a thing in human history. But if our goal is to really, if we recognize that every example of forgiveness is, is a wound to our own being because, you know, we're not at peace, <clears throat> then we have to look at these, you know, bigger grievances in the same way that we would look at um, the a-hole who cut us off on the road or, you know, or our partner who had an expression on their face that we didn't like, um, you know. <laughs> Which is prob probably more frequent than, than, than uh, the other. Uh, in, you got it. In light of recent uh, uh, travel practices, right? <laughs> but, but so, you know, um, I, I tell a story in there, um, one which is within my family about uh, my grandfather, when he was still in um, Russia, Russia under the czars, um, being attacked by a bunch of boys who called him Christ killer. Mm -hmm. And sort of that, that calumny, that accusation from uh, the New Testament, the book of uh, the Gospel of uh, John, I believe, where, oh, the Jews killed Christ. And how that has locked in and really is the basis of all of the anti-Semitism that flowed from it. And I sort of tell this really quite lovely story, at least for me, of how in this one instance, there was a forgiveness opportunity that, that took place that, um, that gave it all a happy ending, uh, which doesn't always happen. And then I, I shared a story from psychiatrist Stan Groff, um, who wrote an amazing autobiography called When the Impossible Happens that if you want something that's just going to blow your mind, it's not Course in Miracles, um, but what some of the things that he's done and gone through are really pretty out there. Um, it's a worthwhile book. And this was a story about um, doing uh, a sweat lodge ceremony with peyote, with um, the Potawatomi tribe, uh, and how one of the people in that tribe just was beaming hatred at him. Mm -hmm. um, I might as well tell a little bit of the story because it's a pretty good It's, it's a great story, yeah. I, I, I was very impressed with uh, both the yeah. stories you're sharing. Yeah, sure. Thank you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, the way the sweat lodge works is everyone gets together first and shares in order to, in a sense, relieve themselves of any biases, prejudices, grievances, so that when they enter the sacred space of the Inipi, the sweat lodge, um, they're not bringing that with them. Mm -hmm. But one of the, um, you know, indigenous uh, peoples there was just, I mean, Stan could, Stan Groff could feel the hatred beaming from this guy and he brought it into the ceremony. And I can only imagine under the influence of peyote how much it may have been magnified and, uh, you know, how, how uh, the feelings could have, you know, um, gotten their claws in. But um, how afterwards, 
one of the participants said something honoring everybody and how grateful they were. And they mentioned Stan Graf, who is a native Czechoslovakian, I guess today it would be Czech Republican. Um, and, uh, and this guy who had just been beaming hatred over the whites and their genocide of the, uh, of the Native American Indian tribes, um, that when he heard that Graf was from Czechoslovakia, he burst into tears and threw himself at his feet. And it turned out that he had been uh, a bomber pilot in World War II, and he had actually bombed a Czech city at the very end of the war in a completely unnecessary bombing raid that devastated the city. And it was one of those beautiful examples of here, he thought he was the victim to this man and then discovered that, oh my God, no, he was actually the perpetrator. He was the killer. He had dropped the bombs that had destroyed Stan Groff's country rather than um, Groff, who clearly wasn't there during the genocide of the Native Americans. Um, you know, uh, that, 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 you know, the roles were reversed. Right. And of course, out of this came this lovely epiphany where this, this man said, you know, if we can't all drop our, our, our racial biases and grievances, what hope can there be for peace in the world or even peace within our own minds? Right. And that's why I tell the story. And um, one of my favorite lines in the book that, um, you know, sometimes as a writer, things just come to you. And, and I stop, probably choke up as I say it. I, I, I wrote something like, you know, um, a shrine to a, a place of holiness, a holy shrine, you know, came into being that day um, on the great plains of the United States. And it wasn't a tourist center and you can't visit it or buy a postcard of it. Um, but echoing, you know, what the course says in the section for they have come, you know, that there is no holier ground on earth and where an ancient hatred becomes a present love, mm -hmm. um, that, that there was, that that's what happened there was a place of holiness that came into being and how amazing and that's what we all want to be doing mm -hmm. you know that creating yeah. um crafting those you know opening up to allow that holiness to come through so that what had been um darkness and hatred can be exposed to the light of holiness the light of god um, the light of love and move into forgiveness exactly exactly oh, yeah it, i was i was it, very it, moved by that story it, too i i i was thinking about how you know it, how we all project you know the the unconscious unfounded guilt onto whatever moving target is is, is handy and without real, realizing you know the the depth and the breadth of that projection often and this story was a great example of that wasn't it yeah and you know projections are self-reinforcing i mean to the extent that we paint the other person in the image of the enemy or the offender, um, the perpetrator, um, they'll tend to behave that way in our eyes. Right. And, 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 and this is why um, I think the aw awareness is such a key component in sort of the, the process of forgiving. Because if we're not aware of the need to forgive, if we think that that grievance is fully justified and, you know, yeah, we're going to forgive the people we love, but the people we hate, screw them, they don't deserve it, then, you know, you might as well give it up and not try to forgive anybody. Um, I mean, they all count. They're all, they're all equal in the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and <laughs> if you leave anyone out, um, we're basically yeah. saying that that uh, duality you know, has trumped uh, oneness, and and uh, of course, miracles says, but God thinks otherwise. <laughs> and speaking of trumping and Trump, um, <laughs> this is you know um, the president of the United States right now in April of 2020, because people might be watching this in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is a source of amazing projection. And perhaps for me, one of the, the most important forgiveness opportunities because it is so easy to project onto. And I think this is true no matter which side of the political spectrum you're on. You can project 
values of power and authority and intuitive knowingness um, and glibness and cleverness, or you can see, you know, supreme ignorance, arrogance, uh, you know, mendacity, I mean, on and on. And what you see is what's going to be there and far better to look at, well, wait a minute, um, this is coming to me piped in through media. Uh, it's media is always to some extent a manipulation. You know, we watch it because it, it gets us interested. And, um, and I'll say something about that in a moment. But to be aware of the manipulations, whether you're watching Fox or MSNBC or some, you know, real extreme, you know, left wing uh, blogosphere thing, um, that we're being fed what we want. I think it's possibly preferable to get that in fiction rather than nonfiction. And there's been an interesting movement in what people read. Most people aren't aware of this, but if you went back to say the 1930s, um, the ratio of fictional books, novels, uh, stories to nonfiction was, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was significant. There was much, much more fiction being consumed than nonfiction. Hmm. And over the decades, that has shifted and reversed to the point where now it's probably something like 10 to 1 nonfiction uh, over fiction, which gives rise to the whole world of so-called reality television, mm -hmm. where, you know, nonfiction, where fiction masquerades as nonfiction. Um, and of course, what a metaphor that, that the course would suggest about that idea, right? I'm sorry. Got, what, I, what 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 a what a great metaphor for what a course of miracles suggests that yeah. uh, that every everything involving space and time and individuality and and the whole thought system of sin, guilt, and fear is pure fiction. Pure fiction. <laughs> In truth. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the world we picture, as Bill Thetford might have said, is a world of crucifixion. Um, you know, <laughs> but, I, when I look in the mirror. I, I I sometimes reframe that as Bruce of fiction, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to remember to not not you know, apply any victimhood there. So yeah, I, I can't do that one with my name. So, uh. <laughs> yeah. but but you know the danger of thinking that something is real is that you've made it real for yourself, right? And now it's locked in and uh, and it won't shift as much. Um, so uh, yeah, we got to be aware of the projections and we got to be aware of. Um, that there's no order of difficulty in miracles, there's no order of difficulty in forgiveness, there's no order of difficulty in relationships. All illusion is equally untrue, and truth is true. I mean, you can't even say it's equally true because there's nothing to compare it to. Exactly. There is. <laughs> pure pure non-duality sort of leaves our language in a, <laughs> in a little gnarled heap on the floor when we look at what we what we attempt to do with it and and you know where we can go with it and and uh, and i and i think that's one of the, the inspiring parts of the course is that it it reminds us that uh, you know where we're headed is really beyond words and, and to yeah. a, you know an experience that really transcends anything we could possibly share in a temporal or a spatial way yeah and and that's why it says you know the goal of uh, that a universal theology is impossible but a universal experience is not only possible but necessary mm -hmm. the whole point of the course which is entirely practical, even if you're in the deepest, thickest theoretical part of the text, it's still ultimately about putting it into practice, is to begin to get the experience. And, you know, when you have experiences of light, when, um, when other people who you thought were stuck in their personalities suddenly say something remarkable that lets you know that, that you're more connected to them than you had any idea of. Mm -hmm. um, then we begin to realize that the ego's um, construct of what this world is and how cause and effect and rationality work and the role of the past in helping us, you know, hone our judgment and get to good judgment, that all of that is bunk. We don't know anything. And when we let go and let God in the form of the Holy Spirit um, kind of take over and do it for us, we get miracles. You know, that, that really is what A Course in Miracles is about. And, and it's not until you begin to give those miracles and see their results or receive those miracles and feel their results that the Course starts making sense. Because I think, Bruce, as you and I have said many times, 
it's such a radical um, upside down take on what we all grow up with as reality that we would, it, it would have to be totally insane. I mean, we would be raving psychotics here talking about this if it weren't for the fact that darn, it works. <laughs> There is a better way. Uh huh. And and we could see peace instead of we could whatever fill in the blank this happens to be at any given moment. That yes. is, it seems to be a grievance or a an upset of any sort or any magnitude, right? Yeah, and there's our choice. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's up to us what we want to see. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and just skipping ahead to the next chapter, the time to forgive chapter. I think that's the one where you you talk about. Uh, uh, Bill Thetford's experience with the colleague that was yeah. hiding behind the newspaper for, right, for a period of time. And uh, I really like that one because they discovered after, after he decided to not make a big deal about it, at least that's my quick uh, cliff note summary of, it, of that, that, that account, was uh, he, he realized that, that they shared a, a mutual interest in Edgar Cayce after you know, a, a comment that his colleague well, a made. Great example of... Yeah of what we were just talking about of yeah. people changing. So I, this, this, this happened during the, the scribing of A Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the teachings were still relatively new to Bill. And my understanding was that when this man, Arthur, who had a, a fair amount of resentment about Helen as, as it, I mean, that's why he was, you know, um, he basically froze Bill out in a very juvenile adolescent way, which um, only happens in high school and in <laughs> academia. <laughs> <laughs> no equivalence between the two, of course. No, you know, you wouldn't get that in the boardroom. I mean, they just put the knife between the ribs, but they wouldn't, you know, freeze someone out. <laughs> so, so this man was not at all subtle about it. You know, when Bill Thetford would walk into the room, he'd walk out. Um, you know, Bill would go into his office and he'd literally tent his copy of the New York Times in front of him and pretend to be reading or would read. And so Bill, quite correctly, I think, thought this is a great forgiveness opportunity. Um, and what he started doing was just going into this guy's office first thing in the morning. And when the newspaper went up, uh, you know, talk about building a wall, um, Bill would just sit there and and essentially meditate, you know, hold, hold a sense of love. Hold, I mean, I don't know what he was doing in his mind, but it was definitely not holding a grievance. And it was not trying to go defensive or rational or convince Arthur, this guy, that, that you know, why was he doing this? Or Helen's really a very good person. He wasn't trying to solve it at the level of cause and effect or two separate individuals in separate bodies. And at one point, Bill had an appointment early in the morning and didn't show up in this guy's office. And the guy was worried. He was like, uh-oh, where's Thetford? And he started asking around and then he realized, oh, okay, you know, he's, he's okay. He just had an appointment. But their relationship shifted. The newspaper came down. Um, they, you know, they became friends, um, you know, uh, uh, an ancient hatred became a present love. The validation of that for Bill, um, and what you were talking about with the Casey thing, um, Bruce, was that they were attending a conference together where the hotel had overbooked and there were too many participants at the conference for the number of hotel rooms. And so the hotel asked people to pair up and share rooms if they were willing. And Arthur came over to Bill and said, listen, you know, um, I, I know a lot of people here. You're the only one I would want to share a room with. Are you willing? And Bill said, of course. So while they were waiting for their room to be prepared, they went into the bar and they, I guess, got drinks. Uh, this being the 1960s, the era of Mad Men. Of course, what do you do while you're waiting for your hotel room? But get a cocktail. And while they're at the bar, Arthur gets the little tray of almonds, takes six of them out, pushes three over to Bill, and keeps three for himself, and says, Edgar Casey told me that if you eat three almonds a day, you won't get cancer. Um, and Bill almost falls off of his bar stool, of course, because Bill had been reading Casey. He knew all about this, you know, because as they were trying to make sense of what happened to Helen, they went far and wide for um, similar kinds of uh, people and experiences. Not only that, he'd been down to Virginia Beach and met Casey's son, Hugh Lynn, 
Mm -hmm. um, and so he's like, Casey told you this? And <laughs> Arthur says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, when I was stationed in the Navy, I was in Virginia Beach and I met Edgar Casey. I used to go over to his house every Sunday and we'd have uh, breakfast together. And for Bill, it wasn't like, wow, we have this, that was the cherry on the Sunday. The forgiveness had already happened. Mm -hmm. That recognition was the recognition of, oh my, this was here all along and I never would have seen it had I not forgiven. I never would have known, you know, that, that, that at least in this regard, we are really aligned. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a pretty crazy, lovely example. And I know a powerful one, you know, for Bill. Yeah, yeah. Another another great story and a reminder that, you know, ultimately all of our grievances are unfounded. And if we only knew, uh, you know, could, could, you know, kind of practice that everyone's fighting us the same hard battle, even though the form may be very different and, you know, uh, in terms of the particulars, but the, the, the same two thought systems are, are having this, you know, it, it, our decision maker, I should say, is having our, having this tug of war, or, you know, struggle or whatever between these two completely contradictory uh, thought systems, only one of which is completely sane. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. Very helpful, helpful story. And anything else is because you, you mentioned, you know, the, uh, the purpose of the Holy Spirit giving us time to change our mind and, and find our way to forgiveness in, in that chapter. I thought that was a particularly. This is one of my big things. Um, phrase, yeah. and, I, and it's probably coming out of my psychotherapy work where, you know, there certainly have been people I've worked with where I would, you know, sit back at the end of the session after they left the room and go, why am I bothering? You know, this, this is impossible. This will never change. But having made a commitment and being a diligent student of A Course in Miracles, I stick with it and um, stay in a loving place. And lo and behold, you know, over the course of time, um, change does happen and things soften and people um, become more loving and more forgiving. So I, I think we often forget that the moment we thought we separated, we also were instantaneously rejoined with our true self, which is even, even that isn't an accurate way of saying it because it presumes that we could leave. Mm -hmm. In our you know, crazy fever dream of separation, um, we were cured of the disease the instant it happened, and the Course makes clear we're reliving this one moment of time, you know, the time of terror over and over and over and over, and we string it out so it looks linear, and here's the past, and here's the future, um, and, you know, we're moving along that line from here to here. In the Holy Spirit's eyes, there's only one purpose for being here, there's only one function, and there's only one use of time to learn how to forgive, to learn how to recognize in your brother the holiness that is also in you. Um, I think the Course is the only metaphysical system, at least the only one I'm aware of, that says you can only recognize your own holiness truly by seeing it in, um, in, in the face of your brother. Not, excuse me, not literally the face, although that too. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a pitfall of newer course students, but also older ones to say, I want to do this. I get it. I get it. You know, I want to rush through this, bring it on Holy Spirit, lay it on me. I can, uh, I, I can handle it. Um, because that's not how you build your forgiveness muscles. That's the ego saying, I want to do this. I love it. And I'm going to be the first person to forgive everyone. And, uh, and, and, and record you know, time, right? wait from the course. Um, so I, I, I'm very fond of reminding people that's what time is for. Take the time. Uh, I, I came on a line just the other day where the course made uh, one of its wonderful puns and double entendres about, you know, forget, and I'm paraphrasing, but forgiveness, it's only a matter of time, um, which is both literal and figurative. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. It's just a matter of time. And, you know, the purpose of miracles is to shorten time, to condense time. Um, the Course tells us forgiveness is the home of miracles. That is a direct quote. When we forgive, we condense time, we shorten it. You know, Bill and Arthur could have, who knows, 
hated each other, um, sniped at each other, criticized each other's papers, um, given one or the other a heart attack, and had to come back in some other lifetime and do it all again uh, as brother and sister. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But time got condensed, and in a matter of X number of months, boom, it's gone. It's healed. So time, when used for the Holy Spirit's purposes, is our friend. Um, as, as the Course says in uh, Chapter 16, The Bridge to Reality, time is, when used for the Holy Spirit, is gentle. Um, fear not that you will be lifted up and hurled into reality. You never get a lesson or a, a, a conflict presented to you for forgiveness that you're not ready to handle. Because the ego will make sure you don't see it if you're not ready, and so will the Holy Spirit. If you're not ready, you're not ready. Um, and sometimes, and, and this is, I think, is one of the um, things that I really respect in 12-step um, work, you can be aware of the need to forgive and also know you're not ready. Mm -hmm. You know, in a story that I think I've told in every book I ever write and probably will tell over and over is of a woman I worked with who'd suffered horrific childhood abuse, uh, multiple perpetrators, and how I, you know, we, we were doing, um, well, we weren't doing imagery work. She just saw what had happened very, very vividly and took it in a different direction in the course of the therapy and was doing extremely violent um, bloody things to her uh, perpetrator. And I'm sitting there going, well, you know, this sure isn't A Course in Miracles. This sure isn't loving. But my gut said, no, she needs to go through this. It's a matter of time. Um, and, and I do tell this in uh, From Loving One to One Love. At a certain point, it just became old. She mm -hmm. didn't need to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. It dropped away. And when mm -hmm. I checked back in at some point later, well, how were you feeling about that guy? She was like, ah, yeah, you know, well, what he did happened. Uh, you know, I don't like it. I wish it didn't, but there it is. So what? It had been integrated into what, you know, as a psychiatrist, what I would call normal memory rather than traumatic memory. And it didn't bring up any emotion in the same way. But had I said to her, look, he's your brother, you're both holy sons of God, you need to just forgive him and let it go. I suspect she would have walked out of my office right then and there and never returned and maybe posted a few comments on my website or who knows what. Um, that we can't go faster than we're ready to go. Um, so and, so you're, you're, big, you're making a big deal out of it would have made it an even bigger deal for her, perhaps. Yeah, and would have yeah. made her wrong. Right, you know? yeah. I would have been telling her that what you're feeling is wrong and what I'm telling you is right. And there is a judgment in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to allow people the space and the time to go through what they're going to go through in the best way that the Holy Spirit knows for them. We don't know what that is. But if we're quiet, if we go inward, if we say, you know, help me to know what to say to this brother or what to do, more often than not, you're going to get, you know, say nothing, be at peace, uh, you know, think loving thoughts. But occasionally you will get something different and, uh, you know, there's your guidance. But, but the moment, oh, you know, in the, the, the places, the place where you see this the most, sadly, is in Course in Miracles groups, where someone's going through something that's really tough and three people are ganging up on them, telling them, how they just don't get A Course in Miracles because all they have to do is forgive. <laughs> it's true in the mm -hmm. big picture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they're not there yet. <laughs> right, right. We, we wouldn't need the remedial cor uh, you know, curriculum of A Course in Miracles if we were already aware completely exactly. of what it's helping us to re remember. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't know what anybody else's path is. I think that's one of the most important things. There's, we certainly don't even know what our own path is. Right. So what, what <laughs> Let alone anyone else's. Right? Yeah. To yeah. think that, yeah. you know, yeah. that you know that someone else should forgive someone or, or not. Um, you know, when we give things to the Holy Spirit, maybe the person with the terrible grievance isn't supposed to work it out in psychotherapy. Um, maybe the Holy Spirit will orchestrate it that that person comes back into their life in some way um, 
forgiving the, you know, asking for forgiveness, uh, acknowledging it. I, I, I'd heard a story back when I was doing a lot of work with early childhood trauma uh, about a woman who'd been um, tortured by her mother. I don't even remember the specifics, but I remember it was pretty horrible and pretty violent. And, and one day, uh, you know, and she'd cut the mother out of her life completely appropriately. And, and at some point, uh, she allowed the mother in a little bit. And the mother said, I'm so sorry. I know what I did to you. I was floridly psychotic. I didn't get treatment for X number of months or years or whatever. Um, I am really sorry. Mm. Now that carries a lot more weight than any therapist working with any, any um, patient or client. Think, so we, yeah. we, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when we know we don't know, now we're in a position to receive. Yeah. Yeah, and we need to be patient with ourselves until we get to that place of not fully yeah. not knowing, I suppose. Yeah, look, we're going to make the judgments. I mean, you know, and yeah. we all do think we know better. I mean, let's face it, uh, anyone who's, you know, living with a, a partner can tell you that, uh, of course, they know the right way to do it, and their partner is an idiot. And, you know, for the sake of the marriage or the relationship, they're not going to tell them that, but... <laughs> I once worked with a couple who I, I was very, very fond of. And he was one of these guys who could think like, you know, 30 moves ahead. Life was an ongoing chess game. Mm -hmm. And he took great delight in it. It wasn't coming. Ultimately, he was coming from a fear place, but he wasn't aware of the fear behind it. And uh, one day, uh, his, his wife got a flat tire out on the road. And he was telling her, do this, do this, do this, do this. And she was a pretty strong lady. So she basically, like in her mind, said, oh, screw screw off and she did it her way and she got you know it all got handled and when he found out that she hadn't done it his way he was really angry <laughs> and in therapy together we kind of looked at it and where he ultimately got to and it was really quite lovely was kind of this epiphany of wow she didn't do it my way and it still worked out she she was able to do it on her own <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously was yeah. more empowering for her and was the lesson that he needed to learn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking ahead to uh, uh, chapter 14, Shadows and Mirrors, Relationships as Reflections of Self, which that, that just the title in itself says a lot. And then, you know, you begin with projection as a cornerstone of the ego's approach to relationships. And, and, uh, you know, there's so much to be said about that. Maybe, maybe you could uh, can you know dive into some of the the inspirations that led to this chapter. Um, so this chapter came out of um, a talk I did years ago about Groundhog Day, <laughs> and in fact, I did it again just this year. So if you want to hear some of that, um, look at my February webinar on the Foundation for Inner Peace website uh, under events, or better still, go to our YouTube channel. Um, but Bruce and I are both fond of metaphor. Um, I like coming up with sort of imagistic ways of understanding things. And so I, years and years and years ago, started playing with the idea of Groundhog Day and the shadow. And this whole idea that if the light is too strong, you know, you see your shadow when you go back into hiding, which is kind of what we were just saying about, yeah. Yeah. you know, the lift is, it, it's too strong a lift. You're not mm -hmm. ready for it. But that in the dimmer light, not the absence of light, because there's always light. You know, the groundhog never comes out at night. I mean, he's too smart for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but uh, in the dimmer light, it's possible for the groundhog to come out and be comfortable. So I'm playing with the idea of, of shadows. And then I go into the whole notion of the Jungian shadow, which are the disowned aspects of our personal and our collective selves that we don't like to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. um, in the story I told about Stan Groff and the Potawatomi tribesmen, you know, his shadow side was the fact that he was a bomber pilot in World War II and was responsible for the deaths of probably thousands of people. Um, he didn't want to look at that. He projected it out onto the white race and in this context onto Stan Groff in particular. Um, the beauty of it is that the peyote ceremony is a healing ceremony and it brought him exactly what he needed. 
um, you know, as, as, as these powerful um, intentions will do. So I'm playing with shadows and I'm playing with the idea of mirrors, um, you know, because the Course tells us your brother is the mirror of yourself. And, and that unlike, well, the problem with projection is that once we have projected our shadow side or the negative impulses that we don't want to look at in ourselves, we no longer see them as part of us. They're out there. They belong to, to that gal, that guy. Um, and now we can react to them as other. Um, we've, we've eliminated them. We've you know, vomited them out of our system and we don't have to deal with them except in terms of how they show up with um, other people. So if you're going to forgive what you have projected, first, you have to see the projection. So we're back to awareness. Second, you have to re-own it. And this is the hard part. Mm -hmm. That's what happened in the healing with Graf and the Potawatomi guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he had projected it out. He's, in an instant, he saw the projection and he re-owned it completely. And it, and it totally blew up the grievance and opened the door wide to forgiveness. So we have to see the projection, we have to own it as ours, um, in a sense, taking it back because we can't work with it if it's out there on someone else. And once it's ours, then we can look at it and say, all right, this is ripe for forgiveness. And in that sense, everybody becomes an opportunity to show us something in ourselves that, um, that we don't wanna see. And, um, you know, if we idolize them, then we get to see the specialness that, that for some reason we put on them rather than um, owning our own holiness and the fact that each one of us has a sacred function given to us by the Holy Spirit that only we can do. And outside the world of form, that is forgiveness. And it's always the same. Inside the world of form, it is unique to you, to your personality, to the time you live in, to the social culture and context that you operate in. You know, only you can reach the people that you live with and know better than anyone else. Um, so, you know, if we're seeing specialness in someone else, that's what we're denying in ourselves. If we see a grievance, then obviously, you know, there's the negative shadow. Um, you know, um, so this goes to, um, Lesson 134, where uh, we're told to ask ourselves, would I accuse myself of this? Um, I had someone the other day who has not a terribly good sense of self-esteem say to me, what's the point of that lesson? Of course I'd accuse myself of that, and way worse. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is a way of taking back the projection. Um, you know, would I accuse myself of this is a way of saying, oh, I was seeing it out there on my husband, my wife, my partner, my child, um, my president, uh, my boss. And when you ask yourself what I accuse myself of what I'm seeing in them, you're taking back the projection. Uh, the metaphor of the mirrors is, you know, I, I think it's just quite lovely. And I always play with the idea that the ego's world is both a fun house that's not so fun, uh, or as I call it in the book, a not so fun house. Mm -hmm. I like that, yeah. <laughs> Where we look around and we see distorted images of ourselves because instead of the Holy Son of God, we see this body and the body is too fat, too thin, too tall, too skinny, um, you know, too weird eyes, too awkward a mouth, you name it. Um, and it's also a hall of mirrors because we get lost and we bump into these other images of ourselves that we're seeing everywhere, um, but we can't find our way through them because we still, uh, you know, we can't embrace them as self. So I, I, I play with a lot of this stuff in that chapter. It was a very playful chapter, um, probably a little self-indulgent, uh, but I, I enjoyed writing it, and I hope people enjoy reading it. Yeah. I like the fact that you brought up again from your previous book, the, the DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, because it I seems like that's, that, yeah. that's just such a, you know, I think a really useful, powerful concept of how, you know, the ego's, you know, standard procedure is dissociation. And in order to take the unconscious, unfounded guilt and throw it out there and then, okay, now, now I can, you know, wash my hands of this and, and, 
and presumably and, and go, go on about my day, not having to think about, you know, the, the festering, uh, you know, illusion really, but uh, we don't see it that way until we look at it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it possible to go through A Course in Miracles and get it and learn it and practice it um, without understanding dissociation? Of course it is. But if you really understand the concept of dissociation, which appears um, in numerous places in the text, um, but the most prominent one being um, the section called Sharing Perception with the Holy Spirit, but I forget what chapter it's in. I think it might be 14. I don't know. Um, if you understand dissociation, all of this makes so much more sense. And I actually think, okay, so sometimes, you know, you get to look back and you go, why did I take the path that I took in life? And why were certain um, learnings presented to me uh, to get me where I am? Well, during my residency, I, I got very interested in multiple personality, which is called dissociative identity disorder. The very first outpatient I had um, suffered from this condition, but I didn't realize it for about two years, um, which is not at all uncommon. I had a psychotherapy supervisor, mentor, who was all into this. Um, and I often asked myself, yeah, it's, 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 it's not as rare a condition as people think, but it's certainly not like it's, it's common. Mm -hmm. um, why did I get so much of this? And now in retrospect, I have a very, very solid understanding of how dissociation works. I also taught hypnosis to psychiatric residents, used it in my practice um, with pain patients quite a bit. And hypnosis is simply a way of inducing um, sort of a therapeutic dissociation, or if it's a stage hypnotist, an untherapeutic form of dissociation. So if you understand dissociation, and we're not going to go into it today, read chapter five of From Nevermind to Evermind, and uh, I, I think I lay it out pretty clearly. But you're right, I forgot that I do um, bring it up again in, in this book with that idea that we're looking out and seeing other people as different, just as the alter personalities in multiple personality disorder see each other as different and see each other as horrible rivals or enemies or this one's my friend but that one's out to kill me and yet they're all part of the same beingness they're all part of the same mind and it you know i think it's a, a wonderful metaphor for understanding our predicament i actually also think it's it's quite accurate i don't think it's i think it's a metaphor that melts into the actual of what happened and how we are in the predicament we're in mm -hmm. um, we are dissociating our true self in order to pretend that we can live in this, this dream world. So thank you for reminding me of that, Bruce. That, that sure, is sure. I just think it's such a useful concept because, you know, we're, you know, it, if, if, the, uh, if, well, the course of met the metaphysics of the course suggests that, you know, we've, we've basically uh, in our minds only in our, our ego minds only, I mean, you know, believe we pulled off this, this unimaginably vast fragmentation and dissociation and, and, uh, you know, unless we consciously, you know, somewhat proactively, you know, ask for guidance and help from what the Course calls Holy Spirit to you know, pull the pieces back together and, and recognize that it didn't happen, um, we're going to continue to to blame through the mechanism of projection all the stuff that we don't want to see in our own mind, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we're going we're gonna to project it for sure. Yeah, exactly. We're going to dissociate it. And... You know, so in the first part of the book, I talked about shame a lot, which Helen and Bill would not have been familiar with. It was not part of the psychoanalytic world. But projection and dissociation to defense mechanisms were very much a part of psychoanalytic understanding. And so Helen and Bill would have been extremely familiar with them. Mm -hmm. And they are used throughout A Course in Miracles um, quite properly in terms of, you know, their, the psychoanalytic understanding. Yeah. Uh, only, of course, A Course in Miracles takes it much, much further uh, because it's not just projecting unacceptable impulses as an ego and a body. It's, as you said, Bruce, going right to the Son of God, uh, you know, having this, this dissociative dream and, uh, and, and falling, you know, Adam falling into a deep sleep and nowhere does it say that he awoke, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly, exactly. 
Yeah, and then then the the last chapter that I was was reading, um, you know, talking about applied forgiveness and and uh, you know where the rubber meets the road <laughs> is, is putting it. You know, what's the litmus test? You know, is a, you know uh, of making sure that you know every person we meet has an opportunity to to um, you know work with our forgiveness not not on their terms but but uh, I, it's my forgiveness opportunity yeah so, yeah yeah so all you know what i do in that i mean over the years over the decades and i'm sure many of you have the have evolved in the same way you discover certain um ways that help you to get to forgiveness um maybe it's certain images uh you know um there's a lovely uh, Buddhist um, practice that I've adapted in my own ways that I heard from um, Bob Thurman on a tape where you see everyone as your loving mother in a different lifetime. So how would you react to your loving mother? You know, if, if Trump were your loving mother, uh, if so-and-so were. Um, I, for myself, uh, even though I have a, a wonderfully loving mother, um, who I had the pleasure to meet earlier this year. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. She's she's a delight. Mm -hmm. um, and even though she's not a student of the course, um, now she lives in the same development as uh, Judy Whitson, mm -hmm. and she's picked up all of the lingo, and she'll say, "Yeah, let's let's ask the Holy Spirit about that." And <laughs> and it's it's delightful, and it's mind blowing, and it's yet another example. Now that you mention it, I'd never thought of this where I didn't try to do anything. If I had tried to, you know, convert my mother to a course in miracles, there's no way it would have happened. And yet, and I see this as a reflection of my own inner work, the outer world shifts to mirror it. And suddenly, speaking of shadows and mirrors, here's my mother, I'm um, talking course in miracles. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's quite astounding. But so for me, rather than trying to visualize my mother, I, you know, I recognize if we're all the same, I think of it in terms of what if we were all identical twins, you know, and everywhere you go, every face you see is really just your own face. And not only that, you're identical twins who grew up in the same way. There's that mind meld and, and your experiences and their experiences are identical. And, you know, can you see people through that lens? Um, some people have told me, yeah, it doesn't work for them. And that's fine. You know, I'm just offering these as as, as little, um, you know, sort of mini practices that might help. Mm -hmm. um, one um, person I did a podcast with recently said, oh my God, I think that was the most helpful thing I've, I've heard in a long time. I, these are just things that I've come up with for myself, where in this book, I thought, yeah, you know, I, I'd like to share them. Um, and as long as we're talking, I might as well, you know, there are a number of metaphors that I wanted to go into more detail. And yet in writing the book, it was kind of like, they just don't need more detail. Mm -hmm. So I often find it helpful to think of forgiveness as a universal solvent. Mm -hmm. um, this is the chemistry part of my brain uh, as a doctor coming forward. And a universal solvent can work two ways. You know, you can have a a beaker of it and whatever the, the grievance is, you put it in the beaker and it just dissolves it away. That would be God, the Holy Spirit as a vast ocean or whatever it is. And you can just take that moment that was so difficult or that person who's so difficult and give them a bath and let them come out, you know, clean and sparkling and full of light, just the way God created them, which would of course mean no body. Um, but, but, it's a universal solvent, or you can get your little eyedropper of forgiveness or your squirt gun, you know, and, <laughs> and squirt forgiveness all over people and, uh, and watch it dissolve away the grime and the gunk and all those things that you didn't like. It's not that they had it, it's that you saw it there and your forgiveness cleans it off of them. Um, I also can think of forgiveness as an autocorrect feature where, you know, we, we spelled it wrong, Holy Spirit, tells us, no, 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 Here, here's how to do it, and just auto-corrects our vision uh, as we go along. So a lot of these nifty little, um, you know, ways of, 
of, of thinking about it and understanding it that I've just found helpful for myself and wanted to share. And they are very helpful too. Yeah, I, I like uh, metaphors and also any, any mnemonic devices that you know, help us jog our memory. Uh, earlier today in, in uh, a, a course study group that, uh, that I started a year, about a decade, uh, 12 years ago, I guess now on Wednesday nights, uh, um, one of the, the people the other night was uh, saying, you know, that they were asking, you know, what, what's A Course in Miracles about? And, and she said, well, um, I, being relaxed, you know, just relaxing. And uh, <laughs> I thought, well, I could kind of meditate on the bit. And then, and then this morning as I was, as putting on my jeans, I looked down and saw a label on the inside that said relaxed. Relax. Fit. Okay, there's a mnemonic device. I mean, we can use anything as a reminder if we're, if we're paying attention and looking for it. So I, I shot yeah. her an email along with the rest of the, the group to say, hey, you know, it's all where, where you're willing to look, you know, and, and, and another fellow who, who uh, uh, lives in Colorado was, was saying he, he was, you know, wanting to, you know, uh, f figure something out and he was kind of cogitating over this thing and, and uh, he, he uh, saw, looked up and saw this sign that was Ask Insurance and it was the name of the, the company and, and, uh, and it was, that was his little triggers like, okay, I just need to ask, you know, the right, the right teacher. <laughs> So, so we get all these little, you know, mnemonic hits if we're, we're memory jog devices, if we're just paying attention to them. And, uh, that, it's a beautiful example. We get what will work for us on our path. Mm -hmm. And if it works for someone else as well, then that's terrific because minds are joined yeah. in forgiveness. Yep. Um, but what works for you? I mean, Judy Whitson used to get stuff. I mean, California has uh, personalized license plates so people can put up all kinds of stuff. And I, I wish I could remember some of the things, uh, the story she's told where, where she'll be driving along and, you know, dealing with something and, you know, the car in front has peace as the license plate. I mean, I'm making that up, but mm -hmm. well, guided, you know, we guided, the Holy Spirit is not limited to being a voice. Um, yes, that is how the Course conceptualizes him, and I think it trains us specifically, um, especially those early workbook lessons, to hear him as a voice in our head, because the ego operates as a voice in our head, the internal monologue, that, oh, no, no, do this, do that, oh, what do you put about this? Um, so the Holy Spirit is an antidote to that voice, but the guidance of the Holy Spirit is by no means limited, and, you know, I'll often find, and I'm sure this is, you know, the case for you as it is for Judy, that sometimes you don't get the voice, but if you still give it to the Holy Spirit, that personalized license plate or the sign, or, you know, you happen to open A Course in Miracles to a particular page, and holy cow, there's that line that tells you exactly what you needed, or some other book, or a character on a TV show. Um, or a lyric or song, or, you know, it could yeah, be anything. Yeah, song lyrics, yes, absolutely, because mm -hmm. they're coming through the right brain, too you'll get the guidance, mm -hmm. but ultimately we want to cultivate a mind frame of, of receptivity to guidance, which is, you know, I don't know the best way to proceed. I know who does know, um, take it from me and give me some guidance. Yeah. Yeah. And it does seem like an, in another, you know, area of, of rubber meets the road, practical, how to apply the course. Uh, a lot of it is just remembering to be gently vigilant and, 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 you know, as, as my buddy Dave's example was, you know, just to notice that we didn't always need to ask. We just need to ask and um, allow yeah. um, that guidance to come through and being practice, 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 being receptive to, to um, you know, learning that there's, there's a better way. And <laughs> we could yeah. see peace instead of this. And, and then we're not upset for the reason we think. Yeah. What, what I found personally, and maybe this will change, is that the more I've um, put A Course in Miracles into practice and you know, made it the mainstay of my life, the less personally I need to sit and ask, what do I do about this or that? Mm -hmm. Rather, as per the rules of decision um, chapter, a section of chapter 30, it's more like, yes, yeah, set your mind in the right place at the beginning of the day you know, it tells us we never make decisions alone. You know, we're always basically choosing with the ego or with Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So if you set your mind to choosing with Holy Spirit, the guidance and the decisions will flow. That said, what I also have experienced um, really just since um, 
taking my role with the foundation is that in group settings, asking consciously, intentionally, is an extremely valuable tool mm -hmm. because you can have the discussion and you can um, you frame the question, but then if everyone in that group lets it all go and says, you know, I'm here only to be truly helpful and I want the answer that that is the accurate one, you will get that. I mean, right down to, I can think of two occasions um, with the foundation where we had to come up with um, a payment, an amount of money for someone. And I'm not talking like a small amount of money. I'm talking about a very large amount of money for translations. And, um, and, and one I was not a part of, but heard about um, with people who were not even part of the foundation. The other um, was much more recent where, where we were told by a translator, I don't want any part of this. Whatever you guys get, I will accept. And both times, the numbers that came through were shockingly aligned. Um, so, you know, it's one thing that we all, oh yeah, let's choose peace over love. And, you know, I mean, those, those are all good, mm -hmm. but you, you know, the course tells us that you will get specific answers to specific problems as long as you think problems are specific. Mm -hmm. And I, in a group setting, here's how to think about it. If you all agree to ask, that is the alignment right there. You might have profound differences about the content, mm -hmm. but if you all agree as course students, we don't really know, and you align to do the ask, now you are moving back toward one-mindedness and forgiveness, and the Holy Spirit's best answer will come through you. And you might each get a different piece of it, a different refraction. You'll certainly have your own ways of getting it. Some will be more auditory. Some will get visions and images, uh, you know, pictures, sometimes very funny pictures. Um, you know, some people would just get a feeling like, yeah, I just feel like this is the way to go. But um, the, the sensory modality that you process it with, it doesn't matter. You've set an intention that you don't know as a group or an individual and what comes through is good. So in group settings, I, I, I still think it's worthwhile doing the ask. Individually, um, yeah, if you're really flummoxed, do it. But, but most of the time, I think if you've done A Course in Miracles long enough, the rules for decision rules apply. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I, and one, one, one last uh, um, topic, uh, unless you have other things you want to share, that, that we've talked about before we started the recording, and that is the, um, you mentioned the word frame, and that reminded me of the reframe, which is a word that you used in some of the writing I uh, just read in your book. And, and I was um, realizing the other day how, what a great um, uh, metaphor that is for expanding our finite definition of self to include others uh, in the capital S self. And even if we just do it, a, you know, a few people or a, a, you know, a group or whatever at a time, um, just metaphorically, uh, we're, we're, you know, holding the intention that uh, we ask for guidance to, to extend the boundaries of self to include ultimately oneness, but uh, certainly sameness and, and extending that uh, sameness and, and sharedness <laughs> to, to include at least the people that we seem to be having issues or, or, or conflicts or questions about. And, and uh, so I, I found that really helpful in the, what I, what I call the, the three R's of forgiveness. It's a little mnemonic that I use of, oh. of uh, it was, I was using reveal, release and replace, but I was thinking reframe actually works really, really well for that first step of, you know, taking, my little sense of self that says there's, there's a problem out there. If I reframe it to include uh, the these alleged others <laughs> in, in my sense of self, then it's like, okay, it's no longer making it about, uh, you know, they're, they're doing something to me. I'm no longer the victim, um, you know, or at the mercy of, I'm now able to be merciful by, by reframing uh, the situation, it's like, bring it back to my mind. And then, then I just have to ask the right teacher in my mind, uh, to then release um, the grievance that I might be having. And, uh, and then the replacement is automatic and the Holy Spirit does the replacement. So, 
Yeah. So I like um, the, the the reveal, release, replace uh, is is one of my new <laughs> updated yeah, mnemonics. Another R. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the three R's. Yeah, yeah. Maybe four. I don't know. Maybe four uh, or five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were, Bruce and I were talking about this just before we started the recording, and um, you know, in in psychotherapy, a reframe, and I talk about this in one of the part chapters in part one. Um, a reframe is just, okay, you saw it a certain way based on your narrow understanding of, the, of things, you know, at the time, especially if you were younger. And uh, you can reframe it in light of more information, more awareness of the greater context, etc. Mm -hmm. And in that reframing of it, it, it no longer has the bite that it once had. Um, you know, you have a greater understanding and therefore a greater capacity to release it and forgive it. Um, but ultimately, and you were, you know, I, I, I thank you for this one, Bruce. Well, I mean, I do say it as well. The ultimate reframe, and that is what I call it, is the Holy Spirit's vision. Mm -hmm. um, because there's only one ultimate context, which is, you know, your dream never happened. You're still the son of God. Mm -hmm. I am as you know, I am as God created me. And so if we can get it out to that level, then everything in the dream gets reframed the same way. And, um, and you know, we're good to go. Um, we're good to return. So, uh, you know, reframes work within the dream, but then there is that ultimate reframe of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we turn it over to the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, because because the Holy Spirit has the big picture and we do not. <laughs> beautifully said, thank you. <laughs> and, and speaking of beautifully said, unless there's something else you want to share, I again want to encourage people to get a copy of your latest book because it is really beautifully done and eloquent and very accessible and uh, it reframes uh, uh, things uh -huh. very nicely. So. Anyway. Thank you. Thanks yeah, it's also available as an audio book for those who oh, don't like great. to read but prefer to listen. Um, I think that that uh, tab is available on, on Amazon uh, uh, and on audible.com. Um, I don't know whether it's available on other audio platforms or not. Um, you know, this is all the publishers doing, not mine. Um, but, but I do know that there are many people um, you know, Judy Whitson has a great deal of trouble reading now because of eye issues, but she sure does listen to those books. And, uh, and some people like listening as they're going to bed at night. So it, 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 you can access it in multiple uh, media. Great. And then as an author, the one thing I would, you know, ask people is if you have the book, if you read it, if you like it, please consider writing a review of any length on Amazon you know, this is what helps people know what's in a book. I can put up all the endorsements in the world, but we all know those endorsements come from people you know or friends or people, you know, who you've interacted with. Whereas the unvarnished, honest thoughts of other readers really sink in. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, this book has not gotten really many if any reviews hmm. and it might just because it's that new mm -hmm. um, but i would make that appeal to anyone listening um you know just an author's plea um you know not so much for myself uh you know the idea that i'll see royalties from any of my books is very unlikely let's just put it that way uh you know but as an author who puts a great deal of time thought and energy into these you kind of want them to be able to reach the audience that could benefit from them. And, uh, you know, and we're all in this together. So absolutely. There, there absolutely. You go. Yeah, very much. So. And, and I thank you, Bruce, for, for hosting these. Oh, so my people... pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying the conversations as well as the, the reading and reflections. Yeah, immensely. me too. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, I think if we do another one, I don't think there's a lot left in the book, but maybe we can, you know, circle back or just let it go wherever it wants to go and then we'll be done. That sounds but, good. But putting these up on YouTube, I think, has been very valuable for, for people who, you know, just want to listen in mm -hmm. and don't know. And, you know, there's so many books out there. You know, who the heck wants to, you know, get another book and put it on your pile of 
to read someday books. Uh, I, I, this is already in my to be reread re pile. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, I have actually had the thought that I would like to listen to it in the audio book because it goes in in a different direction mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, sort of take in my own words from that different perspective. Uh, and um, and I think I'm going to do that one of these days. That sounds good. You know, it's it's interesting. Sometimes I'll, I'll look at the the recordings, and, you know, look and or, or listen to the recordings I've put on ACIMblog.com. And occasionally I'll hear myself saying something, well, where'd that come from? I don't remember saying that. But I, th I think when we, as the more we attune ourselves to, to guidance uh, from the Holy Spirit, you know, we, it's not coming from us, it's coming through us. And I, I think that's something actually I noticed years ago when I was teaching an adult school class back in the late, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and it's like, where did that, you know, you, you kind of notice when you're getting yourself out of the way that things come through and, and in those moments, it's like, wow, that's that's not bad. I, I wish I wish somebody had told me that before. Kind of thing. But yeah, but yeah I, I can totally relate to having you know reread some of the stuff I've written and, and shared. And 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 if you you know when we were successful at getting ourselves out of the way, you know, uh, it's not only has the potential to help others, but uh, you know we can benefit we tremendously can benefit ourselves. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I I could I could apply this stuff that's coming through me. What a concept! And there is something about. Um, <laughs> You know, listening and reading are yeah. different processes. I mean, yeah. when I go out for a walk and do the audio Course in Miracles, I'm always hearing things. I'm like, wait a minute, did I read that? You know, mm -hmm. that, it mm -hmm. just comes through. And then, of course, I'll go back to my book and sure enough, it's starred or, or <laughs> no, I, I didn't. And mm -hmm. here's, you know, uh, my next, you know, 3022nd favorite line in the course. Um, so, so the, the different modalities can certainly be very helpful. And it also ties into what we were sharing earlier about, about how, you know, we're all ready for different, uh, uh, you know, things at different times. And uh, we need to be patient with ourselves. And, and, and when those things do come around, it's like, oh, my gosh, that was in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not to be surprised. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Now you're inspiring me to uh, carry out and follow through uh, on that plan to... Uh, to, to, to do the audio book. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks again, Bob. I always enjoy our conversations and look forward to the next one. And I'll uh, post the, the YouTube link up on ACIM blog and send you all this stuff and uh, looking forward to the next conversation. So thanks Thank again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. And thanks.